what is the Gates Foundation doing with genetics? What is what is DARPA doing with genetics? What is why, how come there's this great constellation of very powerful interest groups that all is aligned in the same direction and seems to be extremely determined to ram this kind of technology through, right? These are really interesting and deep questions that, that I would argue actually go to the fundamentals of what our society is really about. You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome, friends. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com coming to you in a conversation that is being recorded on the 8th of June, 2020. And today we have a repeat guest to the program. You'll probably already be familiar with him if you do watch The Corbett Report regularly. And if not, shame on you. But if you do, you will remember Dr. Jonathan Latham of Independent Science News, independentsciencenews.org. We've talked to him a couple of times in the past now, so I will include links in the show notes for this conversation to our previous conversations. Jonathan Latham, thank you very much for joining us again today. Hi, James. Now, uh, I bring you on today to talk about something that I guess is not breaking news insofar as you covered it on Independent Science News the better part of three years ago. Um, but let's dive into it because I think people will immediately recognize why it is relevant to be bringing up this topic at this time. Uh, the headline that I'm looking at right now from Independent Science News, December 4th, 2017, is Gates Foundation hired PR firm to manipulate UN over gene drives, which is a fascinating headline in a number of different ways. It definitely opens a box onto a number of conversations. I think probably the easiest way to start this conversation, though, is to define some terms that may be unfamiliar to people. Uh, for example, gene drives. What on earth is this technology? What is it that we're talking about when it comes to this story? Yeah, so, so the very short answer is that a gene drive is a genetic system that ensures that if two parents mate, that all their children from then on have the genotype of whichever parent had the gene drive in it, right? So what it does is it biases the, the reproductive outcome, and it biases the reproductive outcome to generate a trait that's chosen by the experimenter. Right, so the, the experimenter can choose a trait like resistance to malaria, or they can choose a trait like all maleness. And traits like all maleness are of interest because they basically drive the population extinct. Right, so you've got a technology that that allows it doesn't kill all the organisms in the population instantaneously, but what it does is it allows you to drive populations extinct in the in the slightly longer term. You know, and in mosquito terms, we're talking, uh, say, maybe 50 or 100 generations to drive a population extinct. So a relatively short period of time. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I understand in the general sense, but let's see how that uh, applies in a more specific context. So if you want to eradicate malarial mosquitoes, for example, how, how do you go about yeah. doing that with, with this technology? Yeah. So, so in principle, all you need to do is release, you know, if the theory works, through a single mosquito, right? A single mosquito that then goes out and mates with other mosquitoes and all the progeny of that carry the gene drive, right? So it basically spreads through the population. So what they would like to do, for example, is they engineer... So, so we have to understand what, first of all, first of all, no longer explanation, we have to understand what gene editing is, Right? Because, because gene editing basically is going on inside the cells of these living mosquitoes. Especially, it's going on at the moment when the cells fuse and the genetic makeup of the progeny is decided. So gene editing is basically a technology, a set of proteins, and uh, usually an RNA molecule too, to do the targeting of basically cutting DNA molecules at hopefully precisely targeted places to introduce a genetic change that inside the egg cells, right, of the new progeny. So basically the, the parent with the trait, that starts off with a trait, then 
edits the the genome because it's it's introduced the genome of uh, is introduced one genome with a gene editing molecule in it. Then that edits the genome of all the progeny. And what's happening is it's basically an, a targeted enzyme that cuts DNA at a specific place that's designed by the researcher to introduce the 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 genetic trait that we're talking about. So, so I think I've explained all the parts of this, but basically if you, what that means is a single mosquito goes and it mates and its progeny itself and its progeny go on to mate more and more and they introduce that trait into the general population. And at each point in this step, genetic changes are being made by the editing machinery. Right, so you've got a combination of technologies in there, actually. Right, and and for people who do need more background on that and the dangers inherent in gene editing, actually, that was the subject of one of our previous conversations where we did talk about some of the uh, the research that has come out to show that the gene editing process is not quite as precise as you were indicating. Hopefully theoretically, it would be in this theoretical experiment we're running, uh, which can in- introduce some very uh, different types of dangers. So I guess that probably brings in the the specter of the PR front that uh, Gates the, the Gates Foundation was using to manipulate the UN over gene drives. Talk about that that relationship. Why is the UN involved in this, and why is the Gates Foundation trying to manipulate them over this issue? Yeah. So, so the UN has a forum called the Convention on Biological Diversity, and this convention meets every now and again, and it's basically the only international place where people can discuss uh, genetics and genetic technologies and GMOs uh, in, a, in a sort of global public sphere that's actually open and transparent, at least transparent to some extent. And so... This, there was a move within the framework of that organization to introduce a moratorium on research into gene drives. And the reason in part for the moratorium is that, you know, as I said, if you, you can potentially the technology is triggered when a single organism escapes from the lab, right? Or a single organism is introduced into the population. If that constant is a lab escape, Right, a single mosquito escapes by accident from a lab because they're researching it in in Italy. Then that mosquito can basically spread around the the globe. Right, the offspring of that mosquito and the trait encoded by the gene drive can basically spread around the world. And you have the problem on the one hand of an accidental escape, and the and the problem on the other hand of how on earth do you test the technology when you don't know if it works until you try it in the real world. Right, because the whole presumption of this technology is that we know what we're doing based on a tiny little lab experiment in which we alter, uh, you know, half a dozen or a few dozen mosquitoes in a very artificial environment, and then we're going to make some kind of prediction as to how that's going to play out in the real world. the The question is, how really are you ever going to know how that's going to play out in the real world? And if you are going to find out how it plays out in the real world, then you're going to run the risk of intro- accidentally introducing organisms in, of, with gene drives into the into the global ecosphere. Well, exactly right. And in fact, I do want to ask, uh, I, 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 we, we haven't prepared for this, so perhaps you don't know the details of this off the top of your head, but in September of 2019, it was being reported that genetically modified mosquitoes are breeding in Brazil despite biotech firms' assurances to the contrary, um, revolving around a, uh, a, a test release that was apparently being done in a Brazilian town of uh, genetically modified mosquitoes. But don't worry, they're not going to release into the general population. Uh, as it turns out, new research that was published back in September of last year was talking about how the British biotech company running the project, Oxitech, assured the public that this wouldn't happen, and uh, uh, unfortunately, apparently it did. There was genetic contamination of the local population of mosquitoes by these genetically modified mosquitoes. Is that related to this gene drives, or is that completely different? It, it is related in that this is this kind of technology, which is, is a sterile male mosquito technology, is considered to be a sort of proving ground for the idea of gene drives. All right, so we have... 
so yeah. So yeah. this article that you you wrote uh, for Independent Science News was two thousand late two thousand seventeen, and was more theoretical about things that were being worked on and researched. So far, we've moved forward a couple of years from that conversation, and already we're seeing some of the dangers, or at least the possible dangers, being realized in some of the tests regarding this technology. Yeah, I mean, in, in a general and specific sense, you know, one, one is that that this particular technology is not working out the way it was planned, and also that that the the general sense of making predictions about how those results would would pan out is not working either. So the Gates Foundation's role in this was to manipulate, use PR to manipulate the UN, what was the Convention on Biological Diversity, to approve the use and, and experimentation with this technology? Yeah, so they wanted to forestall the possibility that this moratorium idea would gather steam. Right? So there was an expert group that was uh, a kind of drawn together called ATEG, A-H-T-E-G, and basically, this expert group was supposed to provide the larger group with information about the risks and, and the possibilities moving forward of, the, of gene drive technologies. And so it had various people who were uh, appointed to the committee. So basically, you know, people apply to the Convention on Biological Diversity to be nominated to this committee. And they try to choose people from different countries, people from different backgrounds, people with dif different research expertise and so forth. And the idea of this committee is it's independent and then it listens to a broader forum of people who comment and there's that broader forum of, of commenters is also, you know, in some sense independent so that, you know, what you're trying to achieve here is a democratic process of understanding that doesn't rely on any particular person, lobby group, company, country, basically steamrolling the process. All right. So specifically then, uh, this relates to a, a trove of emails that was released um, regard that, that basically exposed this PR manipulation. Uh, re uh, it was dubbed the Gene Drive Files. Uh, I will throw in a link to genedrivefiles.synbiowatch.org where it says the Gene Drive Files are a trove of emails and other records uncovered by civil society investigators. The files reveal the U.S. military as the number one funder and influence uh, accelerating the development of gene drives, a controversial and powerful new genetic extinction technology. The files also reveal that a previously undisclosed gene drive advocacy coalition was run by a private PR firm who received $1.6 million in funds from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They p appear to have used covert lobbying tactics to influence expert UN discussion. So talk about the broader context of these emails that were uncovered and what they show about uh, the, the manipulation and, and PR lobbying that's gone on regarding this technology. Yeah, so, so the emails were uh, released about 10 days before the final sort of decision-making meeting. And uh, so they were sent to us. And so we wrote up, you know, basically we just were given access to the website produced by uh, uh, as the group is called Prickly Research. It's part of there's a guy called Ed Hammond who used to run the Sunshine Project, which is basically which was basically about bioweapons and some other sort of shenanigans to do with the military, you know, the sort of military biological uh, confluence. And so this is kind of continuous in a sense with their and his research interest. So, so he, he basically did a FOIA of the North Carolina State University where he suspected some of these people were working. So you've got prominent researchers who, what the emails show, were, were communicating with the Gates Foundation, with DARPA, with... Uh, the, um, uh, the, there's a group called the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health, which is kind of like an offshoot of the National Institutes of Health. They, uh, they're communicating with various universities around the world, various PR companies, and it's all been coordinated by one particular PR company called Emerging Ag, and they're the ones who got the Gates Foundation money. And then uh, so there are discussions, for example, also about how they had meetings at an army uh, military, an army facility uh, in Massachusetts, 
where they, you know, had discussions about uh, what are their concerns, how do they collaborate. Uh, there, there was a work daily a workshop organized by the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health about messaging, like how do we all message around this issue. And then part of these emails, it comes out that this is a, a group who are, you know, firstly, they're discussing collaboration, they're discussing messaging, and they're also discussing how to influence this UN body to get the result they want, which is basically no moratorium. Now, that's a fascinating part of this story that you raised there, the specter of DARPA, our old friends at the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. And in your article, you note that despite the public perception that conservation and public health are what motivates gene drive research, it is known that besides the contribution of the Gates Foundation, most gene drive funding comes from the DARPA, the technology foresight arm of the U.S. Department of Defense. So what is the U.S. Department of Defense, why is the Pentagon so interested in this gene drive uh, technology? I mean, their, their claimed reason is that they want to anticipate other people's research. You know, one imagines China or Russia or something. And then the other claimed reason is that if these other countries use these technologies as bioweapons, which you know, given the fact that you can crash populations of chosen organisms and so forth, and it raises the whole principle, raises that kind of specter. Uh, given the fact that you can do that, then they claim they want to be able to disarm gene drives that are used, right? Like have their own ready and waiting mosquitoes to like combat the, the, uh, the mosquitoes you know, the Russian, as it were, mosquitoes. And so, so they have, you know, they, they don't even have really proof or principle or anything, uh, you know, ideas on how to do that. They don't, certainly don't have evidence that the Russians or the Chinese are even doing this kind of technology, but they still feel uh, empowered to, to do this research, to speculate. But most of their money ends up going to developing the technology in the first place. You know, this is our concern is that, between the Gates and, and the DARPA, if neither of these organizations were funding it, it wouldn't be going anywhere. Yes, exactly right. And in fact, this is the exact same conversation that people have had in the bioweapons, biowarfare space for many decades. And that, that, this is why there is that continuity that you were talking about with uh, the uh, Sunshine Organization or whatever the, the, that phrase is. Because it okay. is, ex yeah. yeah, that's it. It's exactly the same Thing. Oh, we're doing it for defensive purposes, but of course they, in the process of, well, what could the other side be doing here? They have to develop these things. And of course, so it's all under the cover of defensive purposes, but it's actually the creation of bioweapons that wouldn't exist otherwise. And in this case, we have this technology that is being developed in the name of defensive purposes, but of course for, well, defensive purposes or offensive purposes, it would be the same technology. So, um, let's, let's hone in on this. You did say that this, these emails were released 10 days before a me an important meeting to, to extend this moratorium or not. Uh, what were the results of that? So, well, the, the moratorium idea was shot down, right? It's basically what happened. And the, the, I'm not sure what Im impact the revelations had on the course of the meeting. You know, I think our article, for example, was the, it was the only one about the revelations. Science magazine did a did a sort of skeptical piece. You know, is it really true that the UN is being manipulated by the Gates Foundation? And but that came out a little bit afterwards. And so, you know, I wasn't at the meeting, and I don't know how much uh, that information actually reached the delegates. But I think if the delegates, you know, there will be many delegates who will be extremely upset at the idea that people are trying to, to uh, behind the scenes, manipulate the outcome of these uh, negotiations. Because they are international negotiations. And, you know, it's clear that, that there are some groups, like, for example, the commercial sector of agribusiness or of uh, the food industry, for example, that they seek collectively to influence these outcomes. And there are coalitions of countries as well that seek to influence these outcomes. You know, there's always been 
at the CBD this kind of collection of producer nations, right? The countries that produce large amounts of food for export that are trying to break down trade barriers, remove safeguards, remove legal and liability provisions from any of these international treaties, and generally just slow down the treaties and bog down the whole process in, in complicated issues. And those countries are normally the US, Australia, Argentina, uh, sometimes Brazil, Canada, right? So those are the kind of obstructors of this process. And, and, and it's really interesting because the US, which is in arguably at the center of all of this web, is not even a signatory of the conventional biological diversity, but, but they nevertheless sit there as observers and everybody imagines it's really the US and the companies behind it that are really speaking. So like on one level, people understand that there are voting blocks and interest groups. But the fact that they also operate in secret with all these kind of extra little little avenues of power uh, is, is, is also really interesting. You know, there's, there's so much to this, right? There's, there's like the fact that they use scientists as their mouthpieces, right? So like it's a sign, you know, people are claiming to be on the one hand democratic and on the other hand, scientific, right? And you've got basically a contradiction between those two things because, because you know, if science says one thing or claims to say one thing and democracy implies that we should be doing what the majority want, for example, what, what do you go with? You know, there's always this, this kind of really interesting intersection between the science and the democracy. Yeah. And that, of, that, that, of course, has come to the fore in recent weeks, has it not? In fact, that was the one of the key quotes from Neil deGrasse Tyson on Stephen Colbert or whatever he was on. This is a big experiment. Will people shut up and listen to scientists was uh, the yeah. way that he framed this. And that is, of course, the way that uh, yeah. this is always framed. The scientists say, the science says that we should trust this gene drive technology, whatever, whatever it is they're lobbying for. And, of course, that is a lobbying effort that we now have documents that show there is a considerable amounts of money and attention that is being devoted to this issue to make sure that these types of decisions happen. And as you point out, the absurdity of a non-signatory to the CBD sitting as an observer, essentially directing this process and making sure that things go well for their that country's business interests is on its face absurd. But it has to be known in order for the public to even think to be outraged by this. And that is one of the tragedies of this story that... Even myself, who actually tries to keep up with issues like this, I had I had completely missed this story when it occurred. Or if I if it crossed my radar, I didn't pick up on it. That is a huge tragedy because again, if the people are not even aware of this story, how can how can we hope to have a, any sort of informed dissent against the this this gene drive technology? Well, the, you know, the, the mainstream media never cites our website. Right. And because the stories that we investigate go, you know, they're very credible stories. We have all the evidence to back up what we write. But equally, they go into very deep issues. You know, what, what is the Gates Foundation doing with genetics? What is what is DARPA doing with genetics? What is what, how come there's this great constellation of very powerful interest groups that all is aligned in the same direction? and seems to be extremely determined to ram this kind of technology through, right? These are really interesting and deep questions that, that I would argue actually go to the fundamentals of what our society is really about. Absolutely, yes. And at the very least, the monetary incentives here should be apparent and on the table. There is a lot of money that is thrown around to make sure that these decisions happen. And there are companies that make money from the implementation of this technology and safeguarding the, its reputation is part of their literal business model. So obviously, this is something that you would expect a guard dog, watchdog media to be very interested in reporting on, oh, there's a juicy story here about money that's being sloshed around. But for some reason, that does not get reported. No, it's simply shut up and trust the scientists because they are speaking. But don't listen to independent science news. <laughs> no, not those scientists. <laughs> the, the, the absurdity is just obvious to people who are paying attention. But unfortunately, very few people are paying attention to issues like these. On that note, we do raise the specter, of course, of the coronavirus crisis that we have just lived through, are living through, question mark. 
I know you've been doing some research on the real origins of that virus in recent days. Tell people about that coverage. So, well, you know, the, the, what we've done is investigated the lab origin thesis because it's clear that the mainstream media didn't want to investigate and they consider that, you know, for the most part, there have been some interesting exceptions to that this time around. Like Newsweek, Forbes magazine has just done a little article about uh, possible lab origins. So there's some kind of right wing media and, and semi right wing media that's kind of gone quite strongly on this. And then the left that's basically resisted it. I mean, the left needs to develop an adult relationship with science. That's my interpretation of this. Because you know, we've tried to publish. We normally have no trouble getting our articles published in left-wing magazines, right, websites. But nobody wants to touch this issue, right, because they think that, that science speaks in the way that you say. And science never speaks, right? It's always individual scientists, right? There's normally in the background a whole set of scientists who totally disagree with what's being claimed in the mainstream media, but you won't ever hear from them, and the mainstream media won't go to them. So... So, and this is the case with the coronavirus origins, right? There are a set of scientists like uh, Stuart Newman, for example. There's a, a guy from Australia called Nikolai Petrovsky. And they are, you know, very experienced scientists, some of them virologists who are very concerned about the potential lab origins. There have been a long history of, of uh, warnings of lab escapes from uh, vaccine experiments, from uh, from just general messing around with viruses of, of high pathogenic potential. And we have a lab outbreak that happened within walking distance of a lab that's researching that coronaviruses and is the world epicenter of collection and research on that coronaviruses. Like, what is the chance that the coronavirus outbreak epidemic would originate literally within walking distance of that lab? Yeah, right? exactly right. And... and and yes, okay. let's let's keep this in the perspective of that gain of function research into viruses that yeah. in exactly like this this biological warfare research. Oh, we have to do it because otherwise the enemy will do it. In this case, well, we have to do it to in case something naturally arises, we have to have a vaccine ready for it. So we'll create yeah. these new va viruses and yeah. just hope that they never accidentally or on purpose get released, right? Yeah. So so you know the 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 short version is that we think a lab release, not biowarfare, we don't think that the Chinese were engaging in biowarfare, just a simple lab release, either an accident with a pre-existing virus that they were collecting and brought back to the lab, or some kind of genetic engineering experiments they were doing, because, because the research that they're doing at the WIV, right, the Wuhan Institute of Virology, the, that's being funded in the U.S., by the way, and this comes back to Gates, right? We we always say all roads lead to Gates, and and the uh, what what they're doing is attempting to show experimentally that the viruses that they find are potential pandemic pathogens, which means in many cases making them into potential pandemic pathogens. So so you've got this very scary research that's going on in these labs, and this one particularly. And the uh, and you've also but you've also got this whole agenda, which is a Gates-driven agenda of highly targeted responses to uh, to potential to, to actual and potential diseases, right? So you've got uh, essentially the Gates Foundation is the kind of motivating force behind this idea of you know identifying pandemic pathogens, potential pandemic pathogens, or to using uh, vaccines to combat polio, for example, at the expense of doing traditional public health, right? So traditional public health is having PPE, making sure your health, your hospitals are working well, that your staff are trained, that the population has good nutrition, that uh, that, that there is, you know, a reasonable infrastructure that everybody has a doctor that they can go to, so on and so forth. Right? This is traditional public health, which in many cases is absent from these countries because the Gates Foundation is focusing on vaccinations and on, and on kind of targeted uh, versions of public health, 
right? So you've got this kind of battle going on between people who want traditional public health, but they're not backed by the Gates Foundation, but have a lot of logic in the, on their side, right? Because, because think about it, traditional public health is about, you know, if, you have, if, every, if the doctors all have supplies of PPE and they're well-trained and the population is well-nourished, you're protected against all different kinds of potential pandemic pathogens, against polio, against all the kind of childhood diseases that people get. That, that kind of public health protects against everybody, but it protects against all kinds of diseases, benefits everybody regardless, more or less, in the population. But it's not research intensive. It's not high tech. It doesn't support this huge infrastructure of research that the Gates Foundation would like to, and so, to have. And so you've got this whole, basically what I call the pandemic virus industrial complex, right, of research scientists, of vaccine manufacturers, of, of treatment manufacturers, who are basically driving the Gates-type approach to public health, that ultimately, if the lab origin theory is correct, is actually the cause of this pandemic, right? And has been, we're fairly confident that has caused previous uh, viral outbreaks. Right, so you've got these people who claim to have a solution, but actually appear to be a large part of the cause of the problem. And, and at the same time, in neglecting the real problems of palm oil, destruction, logging, roads in rainforests, rubber uh, plantations in these countries where Ebola virus is breaking out. Right. And, and another aspect of that that agenda is of course that you can also then you can patent a vaccine or a drug or something along those lines and you can make money manufacturing them and lo and behold the gates foundation of course is literally partnered with vaccine manufacturers in an organization like gavi so i mean it, it there is again the basic obvious conflicts of interest that are at play here amongst these players with basic monetary incentives that are not difficult to uncover but you never hear about that again it, when uh, this is being covered in, in mainstream outlets. And I want people to reflect on that. You make an important point about the weaponization of science that the left will use. Oh, but you have to listen to the scientists on this issue, but not that issue. <laughs> and the right, well, don't listen to the scientists on that issue. But this issue, yeah, it was the Chicoms that did this. Uh, you know, it's, it's always, uh, of course, Science is not is not a statement that is being said, spoken in some unified voice. It is a technique for trying to get closer towards something approximating the truth. And it's a messy business that has lots of, obviously, lots of different people taking different perspectives and can be weaponized in that way politically. And uh, I'll just take a moment to plug a video I did about, about this a few years ago called The Weaponization of Science, where I pointed out this phenomenon. I think it's extremely important. And... Uh, I, I like to think the public is becoming aware of this because of things like what we've just lived through for the past few months and the highly political nature, obviously, of this debate. Um, but I'm not sure it, that message is really getting through to audiences that are living in echo chambers and not aware of sites like Independent Science News. So for people who don't know about your site yet, just tell them a little bit about it and what, what it is you do there. Well, normally what we do is issues in food and agriculture, but... You know, the reason why we do food and agriculture is because food and agriculture are the epicenter, if you like, of our social ecological crisis, right? If you have a problem with your water supply or the problem with your, uh, with your oceans or a problem with climate change or a problem with uh, uh, public health, the likely origin of that problem is agriculture and the food system, right? We have basically the food, the food and agriculture system even most people live in cities and don't really appreciate that many of their problems originate in the countryside, right? From pollution, dead zones in the ocean, climate change is an agricultural problem, right? The EPA, really interestingly, has produced a report saying that only 9% of climate emissions come from agriculture. Many, uh, there are other uh, much better, in my opinion, calculations that that number is well over 50%, right? So, so you've got our, our basic problem is being hidden from the public that our problems actually originate in many cases from agriculture. And so normally our website focuses on agriculture, but then that has, uh, uh, you know, that, that ends up being a gene drive issue because gene drives end up being used potentially in agriculture. 
and the, our investigation of the coronavirus is kind of a kind of you know it seems like an aberration except that the the issue of coronavirus also is an agricultural issue because the people who are funding peter dazza we didn't even get into this but the people who are funding eco health alliance and peter dazak who is the media's person who's explaining to the whole population what that that the wildlife trade is the origin of coronavirus and it's people hunting people using uh, wild animals for, for medicine right if you read the guardian the new york times cnn and uh, democracy now he's on all these outlets explaining blaming the wildlife trade when the real culprit is things like palm oil and logging, and guess who guess who funds his eco health alliance? Right, it's the palm oil industry, and so so you've got all this this things come back to agriculture, whether you think they do or not. Right, and that's what I was just saying. This is being hidden from people, and so so people often don't appreciate the significance of doing research on agriculture. All right, so to tie a bow in this conversation, bring it back to the gene drives um, where we started. Uh, I, I, as I say, this article that we're talking about will, of course, be linked in the show notes so people can go and read it, but it is two and a half years old at this point. Uh, I assume the conversation has progressed or perhaps regressed since that point. Uh, where does the conversation lie with gene drives at this point, and is there any hope for a resurgence in the idea of some sort of moratorium on this? I mean, the, the success of people in actually getting the technology to work hasn't moved forward very far. What we do know is that the big, the big changes that have happened is that the actual gene editing process, like the molecules, the proteins that alter the DNA and, uh, and actually are the kind of molecular heart of the gene drive process, we now know that they are much more imprecise than we ever thought they were. Right. So, so, so it turns out that they introduce genetic duplications that different versions of the gene drive technology, the gene editing machinery, basically have different effects on the genome. That people have been underestimating the amount of changes that gene drives that that gene editing makes in the genome. Like people found out they were missing various kinds of uh, changes. We still don't have very many people actually sequencing whole genomes of edited organisms in an unbiased fashion to try to genuinely look for, for gene edited alterations. This is one of the interesting things. It's like, don't look and don't see, you know, what, and so don't do the experiments that would actually test the, the, the true accuracy of gene drive experiments. And the, the, hilarious, the hilarious one that came out not so long ago was the cows I don't remember if we talked about this, but the cows that turned out to be the exemplars of precise gene editing turned out to have antibiotic resistance genes in them and, and with them became part of a breeding program in Australia and Brazil. And so, so, you know, what was considered to be a very, very precise technology is now being kind of rowed back a little bit. But, but, but the precision is necessary to make the arguments for the safety of gene drives, right? You can't, you can't argue that, that, that gene drives are going to be safe uh, in the environment if the underlying molecular mechanism is not precise. It becomes really hard at that point. Absolutely. But they don't stop yeah. trying. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. This foundational technology that we're we're using as this uh, this main thing is wrong. But other than that, everything's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it is again. It, uh, the more you know about it, the more absurd it becomes. But unfortunately, people don't know very much about this. So let's correct that and direct people towards your site. Once again, it's independentsciencenews.org. Lots of valuable information there. As I say, we've had previous conversations, including a conversation specifically on gene editing and the dangers thereof. So I hope people will check into that. In the meantime, Jonathan Latham, thank you very much for your time and your research. Thank you, James. <laughs>